I do remember one of my first visits when I went to meet Marjorie's parents. They had bought a piece of land years earlier with plans to build a home that would suit them in their retirement and host their children's expanding families. Perhaps that was one of the reasons for my visit, as they had their eye on me. <clears throat> and in 1996, they broke ground, and up from that good soil came a beautiful home, fashioned in the style of La Campagne in France, and with gardens in the style of the Levant, including a huge fig tree near the kitchen windows and colorful flowers and bushes scattered around the front with willows, juniper bushes, and other growth that made it feel like a Mediterranean temperate zone. And Edmund, Marjorie's father, after whom we named our son, had reserved two special places to plant what Marjorie told me were parasol pines, one for Marjorie and one for her sister Valerie, grown from pine nuts that he had obtained from Lebanon the country to the north of his birthplace in Haifa, Palestine, because Edmund and Brigitte had lived in Beirut after they were married. I could relate to this. When I lived in Cambridge, I replanted a lilac shoot from an ancient bush my great-grandmother Gertrude had planted just behind the shop at our family home in the Adirondacks. Generations since then, had loved its smell and its color, and planting that lilac bush brought the Adirondacks and all that had ever lived and died and been built and burned to the ground in my family there to my home in Cambridge. These pines from Lebanon were a way, I think, for Edmund to stake a claim in Potomac, the land of his home, perhaps because his home in Palestine <clears throat> had been taken from his family in 1948. And the pines seemed to me to symbolize the resolve and resilience of Edmund Asfor and his people. And today they grow sentinel in their beautiful and colorful yard, an homage to the Eastern Mediterranean in Maryland. In our reading from Hebrew scripture this morning, Ezekiel proclaims the word of the Lord to a people who are exiled in Babylon, a merchant land. And the Lord uses a cedar tree for Ezekiel as an allegory for the people of Israel, where earlier in that chapter, an eagle, presumably the king of Babylon, had taken a sprig and planted it in that foreign soil where it would grow and seed. This morning, Ezekiel proclaims that the Lord will take a sprig from a lofty top of a cedar that had grown there and replant it back onto the high and lofty mountain of Israel. In order, he says, that it may produce boughs and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. Under it, every kind of bird will live in the shade of its branches will nest winged creatures of every kind. You see, when the Lord establishes something, it will flourish nobly, producing fruit and providing security for every kind that nest in its cover. The pursuit of this effort will also create a place of equity. For he says, it brings low the high tree and makes high the low. Because the Lord is in charge, after all, not human beings, for those who are powerful in this earth and for those who are weak, the way of the God's kingdom is equity, described in a vernacular of mighty cedar trees and lofty mountains. Now, I remember my brother Ted <clears throat> once imagining, after taking a Bible class in college, imagining Jesus trying to get the idea of God's kingdom as Jesus understood it, through to his fishermen disciples. A concept they may, not, they may have heard growing up in their homes, but may not have ever studied in school much. They were fishermen after all. 
They weren't scholars. And so Ted imagined Jesus grasping at images, anything really, to convey an idea that may have been a bit different than they'd learned at home. Let's see, Ted could hear Jesus say to himself, let's see, how do I do this? Well, let's see, the kingdom of God is like a woman who sweeps the house. No? A man who builds his house on sand. Not yet. As if someone scattered seed. Oh dear, wait now, I've got it. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. As Jesus continued to point out, it grows, after all, into the greatest of all shrubs, bringing cover to birds and their nests. Now, Jesus chose parables because direct words, I think, fail the job. And like poetry, or maybe like seeds themselves, parables must be relied upon to spring their truths mysteriously. And what a stark contrast is this, language of cedar trees, which indeed you even see on the flag of Lebanon, and language of a pedestrian mustard shrub. The Lutheran pastor Nadia Bowles-Weber, writing in Christian Century magazine, thinks that Jesus here is simply being ironic. He's carrying on the upside-down comedy that his whole story reflects. The nobility and majesty of a homeless, unwed mother. The royal greatness of a peasant from an insignificant town. The honor of God dining with whores and traitors. The gallantry of a God who dies a pathetic death. And then there is the resurrection, she says, the punchline to the greatest joke in human history. In the end, God has defeated death itself, while we are still offended by the joke. Frederick Buechner puts it somewhat more pointedly. He says, if it's heard as anything other than a wild and marvelous joke, the gospel is the church's thing the pastor's thing, the lecturer's thing. If it's heard as a joke, high and unbidden and ringing with laughter, it can only be God's thing. In the didactic of what we receive from the world and even from the established church, we may miss much of what God in God's Holy Spirit holds out to us, a mystery that is eternal. Now we enjoyed a different kind of worship this past Sunday with a praise band and glow sticks, images our, of our beloved who had graduated from school and from this life, punctuated by witness testimony offered bravely by members of our youth group. Communion came at the end from reserve sacrament as a sort of Episcopal tether to the morning's gathering. Contrasting Leo's youth-led worship with our traditional BCP worship and, hymn and hymnody could, excel, could itself seem comedic, high and unbidden and ringing with laughter and resonating beautifully with Jesus' kingdom of God, cedars and mustard shrubs and all. Contrasting years earlier, the lively music and energy of Audrey Okeiwe's baptism in 2012, which had its own kind of movement, music and colorful array, contrasted against the BCP and Eucharistic prayer B, right to, offered in my own inimitably dour English manner, seems to me comedic too. And in that, fully of God's kingdom. We are a church willing, able, and generous enough in spirit to do this. 
and it is my great gratitude to be part of this sacred dance of collaboration, experimentation, and even tension sometimes between the old and the new, the familiar and the strange. This is a mystery of a dance which we do well to embrace as followers of Christ. Between the anchor of tradition and the spirit of whatever's emerging, our brother George Corbett described the image of a kite dancing as we sat in our Saturday men's group. The dance of the kite will depend on both the tether and the wind, the planting of the old and the growth of the new, continuity in the midst of change, parasol pines in Maryland, sometimes stark contrasts between what tradition might declare and what otherwise might be coming to the surface. May each of us allow ourselves to discern the movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our community and take delight in it and find ways to rejoice in all that she is bringing to us in what lies ahead. Amen.